It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the indelible John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How you doing this morning, John? And your your rock star self? <laughs> I'm pretty good. I've been better. I've got uh, something wrong with my eye, hence the rock star glasses. But uh, I'm I'm doing good because we're going to talk about today one of the greatest industrial heroes in history, John D. Rockefeller. Yeah, I'm excited. The wealth. The wealthiest American in history, and I, I want to have a I want to have a rock star <laughs> look myself, you know, for 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 this show. For so, me. like when we, did, <laughs> you know, like when we did when we did Chuck Yeager, I got my aviators and everything, but I'll hold them I'll hold them in re, in reserve. Um, the John D. Rockefeller, of course, uh, president of, of Standard Oil Company, a giant in the in the field of oil uh, re refining, and just a, a giant in the in the field of industry. Uh, all to, all together, John. You know, in in contemporary dollars, I think it was in nineteen nineteen dollars at the height of his his wealth in the early twentieth century, he was worth in today's terms over four hundred billion dollars. <laughs> That's, I mean, in our day, Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos are worth you know one hundred eighty billion. A bunch, a couple of pikers, right? Uh, 180, 190 billion. Rockefeller was worth more than twice that in terms of the purchasing power, you know, of of, of his wealth. So he's he's considered the wealthiest American in history, uh, one of the wealthiest men in history generally. And the big question debated by the historians, of course, is did he earn that wealth or was he, you know, did did, did he gain it by duplicitous means? Was he a robber baron? In Matthew Josephson's terms, or was he a productive genius? And that's, you know, I, I, that's the that's one question that we want to discuss today, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. We're going to get into that, and I think set the record straight. Um, but uh, you know, th this industry was, you know, today it's a multinational industry. It was uh, something much like the the gold rush at the time that oil discovered and, and people figured out that it could be used for uh, bringing light to people. So um, let's let's dive in and just talk about the development. Yeah. yeah, let's get go to the beginning. Rockefeller was born in 1839. He, Johnny died in 1937. I mean, he, he was almost 98 years old when he died. So he lived that he lived a long uh, life. Now, his father was an, like an itinerant peddler, right, in in in, in upstate yeah. New York, and, yeah. and you know it was just something of a scamp, you know, able to support the family. So he wasn't poor in his childhood, not not in, this, not in the way that Andrew Carnegie was, who we'll discuss, you know, on the Hero Show one day. But Rockefeller did have to go to work at, at age sixteen as a as a bookkeeper, uh, and he was making something like four dollars a week. <laughs> to four dollars a week, the purchasing power of a dollar in eighteen w w that would have been eighteen sixty eighteen fifty three um eighteen fifty five the purchasing power of a dollar was you know much more than it was today, but still four dollars a week is not a, not a lot of money you know to start out for the for the wealthiest American in history is it yeah and, and I've heard that his his father was literally a snake oil salesman like that's what he did he sold medicine that didn't work and and basically was poison. And when he occasionally came home to his family, he would cheat his own sons. He would find ways to to get their money as well. And uh, oh, nice guy. he actually said, "Yeah, he he said that he thought he was uh, trying to to build their character. In effect, that it was it was good. They yeah, they so learned how to. How... <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> they learned how to funny. turn a plate into a platter." It's not. It's not fun. It's, I shouldn't be laughing. But yeah, that's a way to build your kids' character by by you know, set an example of them for them as a snake oil salesman and as a, and as a cheat. But yeah, that not recommended, uh, gentlemen out there for, for for fatherhood. Not a good. Not a good uh, role model for you, for your for your sons. So uh, so the, the wealthiest American history starts out. You know, at this. Uh, you know this job that's just making him just making him i wonder i wonder what the purchasing power of four dollars was in in the 1850s i don't i don't i don't know but yeah i know 
the inflation rate has been enormous since then. So it may have been equivalent to, I don't know, is it equivalent to $100? Whatever, whatever. It, it's, it's not a lot, what, what, not a lot of money. But this, this, this is how he starts out. And uh, how does he get into the, uh, into the oil industry? Yeah, so he had a, uh, a balancing influence in his childhood. His mother was basically the complete opposite of his father, brought the kids to church every day and tried to really instill character in them. Um, he took a lot of odd jobs growing up. He just tried to do everything he could to make ends meet and help his family. And still, even then, uh, you know, he's taught these, this Christian altruist ethic. He would give a lot of his money away. He'd give five to 10% uh, based on what he could. And, um, you know, he I, decides, I, he decides tithing. to go to, yes, tithing. You got it. Yeah. That's the, the. Uh, Christian name for giving away 10% of your income. And so he decides to go to uh, business school. He's conflicted. He was uh, very interested in music as well and, and loved playing music. But uh, he decided to go to school for, for business, for accounting, and went into a six-month program that he finished in about three months and then decided to quit school and go look for a job. And he, you know, he went from door to door to door and, and uh Basically, it was just incredibly persistent looking for a job. Nobody was uh, looking to hire at the time. And finally, he got one. I think it was September 26th. Uh, and I forget the year now. But for the rest of his life, he celebrated that as job day. Every year, that was his own personal holiday, the day that his working life began. And he starts in this company uh, where he was for several years, selling all sorts of goods for other, for other companies until... Uh, I think four years in, he decides to start his own, uh, start his own firm doing the same thing, and they are doing extremely well. After their first year, um, they are they're already making something on the order of about four thousand dollars, which, as you pointed out, inflation it's worth a lot more today than it was then. Second year, seventeen thousand yes. dollars, and a few years in, uh, a chemist, uh, Andrews. Uh, uh, Get his first name, but uh, introduces himself and interests the the brothers in going into the refining business. It was Samuel? Was it? Was it Samuel Andrews? I think you got it, Samuel Andrews. Yeah, right. And I don't, John. I don't remember who was Samuel Andrews or one of Rockefeller's other business partners. But you're absolutely right. He was a devout Baptist his entire life, Northern Baptist. Uh, devoutly religious. We'll, we'll discuss his philanthropy, you know, as as we as we go along with with his career. But one of his partners said at one point that that Rockefeller was fanatical about honesty in business. You know that that even his worst enemies acknowledged his word was always good. And one of his one of his partners might have been Andrews who said that you know if if the company was owed a penny. Rockefeller wanted the company to have it. And if the customer was owed a penny, Rockefeller insisted that the, the company pay it uh, to him. So, you know, his, his, his character and was, was very strong. And we'll, we'll see how that relates to these charges, you know, that, that have, have been leveled against him, you know, that he was a robber baron. But, yeah, the early days of the oil industry were just chaos. You know, you know what's you know what's interesting, John, uh, and, and and it leads to a wider to a wider point is that this you know starts the the oil rush starts in Western Pennsylvania, right? And for years, this this black stuff had been oozing up out of the ground, bedeviling farmers in the in the area. Uh, it, you know, it, it, ru it ruined the land for for agriculture, and uh, you know nobody saw any use for it. By the late eighteen fifties, uh, you know, a, a few chemists. Uh, had, had figured out. Wait a minute! This this stuff can be used as a, as a brilliant illuminant, and of course, the, you know, there's money to be made here. And the oil rush began, and it was chaotic as a, a gold rush uh, um, could be. And there were, you know, there were all kinds of you know wildcat oil companies, you know, indep small independent oil companies competing. Very wasteful. You know, they they didn't have any use for no no know about any byproducts. For, you know, from from the petroleum. So when Rockefeller moved into the to the refining end, uh, he, it was at at the start of his career. What was this eighteen eighteen sixties? You know, this this was a this was an enormously chaotic industry, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for a time, whale oil was the only place you could get kerosene, 
and uh, was it George Bissell and Benjamin Silliman that figured out they could use this, you know, black stuff. You could get kerosene from it. You could refine it. Texas and then tea. E. Texas Drake. tea it became. Texas tea it became Texas known tea. later on. In, yeah, you know, as when the oil industry became big in the in the state of Texas. Yeah, and it's and it's it's a, it's an interesting point, you know, that um, in in response to environmentalism, you know, that we're going to run out of resources. It's because historically, there's all this stuff. That's you know that that the earth is 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 filled with that this people saw no use for, you know, uh, this black stuff oozing out of the ground, you know, is, is one major example. And you know that they, the, the, you know, there's um, there's 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 all kinds of you know of of instances of this uh, fiber optics. I think you know are made in in part from sand. You know, just you know. And you know, and it, until the until the human mind sees uh, sees some use for for various substances, well, it, 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 it you know it's just it's just ignored or or, or even is a, is a nuisance like the this black stuff oozing out of the ground in Western Pennsylvania. So, uh, you, you know, I think it was the economist George Reisman who pointed out that the you know it's it's, some, it's roughly. You know, four thousand miles from the surface of the Earth to the to the Earth's core, and the Earth is a solidly packed ball of matter. You know, the uses for which of many of this stuff, you know, nobody nobody has you know any any idea of. I mean, I think they use you know human and animal waste products in in, in some cases. You know, to 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 produce energy. So every 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 substance in the world, whether it's sand or this black you know, this black goop oozing out of the ground or, or you know excrement waste products you know you never know what kind of use this this could have until you know the 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 human mind figures it out so you know, benjamin silliman uh, is one of the early ones to figure out that that the that this texas tea this pennsylvania tea in the 1850s you know could be used as an aluminum it was was he was he a, a professor of chemistry at Yale? I'm trying to remember. I know I know one of, one of the early founders of, of use was was a Yale a, a, a Yale professor. Was it Silliman? Yes, yes, yes I think it was. Yeah, yeah and I so like you said, yep, professor of chemistry. Right? Yeah, okay. Loads of waste in this refining business, and people are going into refining left and right. They see this opportunity, much like the people did during the gold rush. Uh, and they create a, this incredible capacity for refining oil that far outstrips the supply of crude oil. So there's a, there's more demand for the, the refineries have more demand for the crude oil than the suppliers of crude oil can keep up with. And, you know, while they're doing this, they are throwing away something like 40% of, of the total product. They're, you know, they see no, no use for this, you know, crude and, and the crude by, byproducts. Rockefeller, he declares war on waste and seeks all sorts of new ways to get, not only to get more kerosene per barrel of crude, but also to use the various by, byproducts, you know, just like you're talking about a minute ago with all these different elements in, in the earth's surface well here's one we've got to we've got to deal with this stuff anyway is there anything useful that we can do with this and you're talking about the power of the human mind to figure this stuff out well rockefeller you know is an early example of what capitalists came to be they came to understand that the uh, the human mind is the source of all of these values and he was not at all uh, you know some, some say that he's a penny pincher well, it, he was not when it came to research and development. You know, he was one of the few that was employing scientists and building laboratories to figure out what can we do with this stuff. So, you know, gas right. for fuel, they right. use gasoline for fuel at his own plants, tars for paving, uh, naphtha they sent to gas plants. He created lubricating oils, Vaseline, paraffin for wax, uh, for candles. Uh, just so many, he found oh, so many know. different ways to, to declare war and waste. Go ahead. Absolutely right. I, you know, I just happened to have a copy here just by accident, you know, of, uh, <laughs> of the, of the cap, the capitalist manifesto. Uh, Highly recommend and, you it. Know, this, you know, thank you. And, um, just wanted to read 
a passage uh, from his, his in the uh, in the appendix to the Capitalist Manifesto, which is titled "Robert Barron's or Productive Geniuses," and. Uh, Rockefeller chose the refining end of the business and his hometown of Cleveland with its advantages of Lake Port and multiple railroads as his base. And like you said, John, he then declared war on waste. He and his partner Samuel Andrews sought ways to get more kerosene per barrel of crude oil. They searched for uses for the byproducts. They, they, they used gasoline for fuel. Now, this becomes enormously important some, you know, 30 years later when Henry Ford of course, is, is going into business manufacturing automobiles. And uh, uh, it was Rockefeller at, at Standard Oil who was one of the first guys to, to realize that gasoline, you know, and, and produce gasoline as, a, uh, you know, uh, as a fuel. And, of course, I don't know what gasoline cost per gallon, you know, at the turn of the 20th century. I imagine it was just pennies. But that helped Henry Ford, you know, the... the the existence of a cheap fuel for the automobile helped Ford revolutionize the personal transportation industry in, in, in the United States and then eventually around the world. And again, to step back, John and everybody out there in Hero Land, you know, and, and, and see the big picture, it is just fascinating in a free society and a free market where individual rights are upheld and protected by government, the innovations that build upon innovations here. Uh, uh, Ford able to mass produce automobiles inexpensively in large part because of Andrew Carnegie's achievement in that time of inexpensively producing steel and also relying on a cheap, uh, inexpensive fuel like gasoline, which was uh, produced uh, overwhelmingly by uh, John D. Rockefeller at, at, Standard, at Standard Oil. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right, John. That you know, lubricant oil, Vaseline, paraffin for making candles. Uh, by contrast, listen to this. This, this is this is a great, uh, uh, really interesting little tidbit. By contrast to Rockefeller, some of his his competitors let their gasoline, for which the market was not yet developed, run into the Cuyahoga River, supplying sport for tugboat men who would throw overboard a shovel full of hot coals to set the water ablaze. That was the that was what his that was what a number of Rockefeller's early competitors did with gasoline. Like like Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller <laughs> Rockefeller was a stickler for cutting costs. Yeah, one of the things he did uh, was he 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 uh, employed his own plumbers and almost cut in half the cost on labor pipes and plumbing material. And similarly for barrels, barrels for oil cost two fifty a piece. But Rockefeller bought his own timber, his own kilns, and, and his own wagons for transportation, and thereby reduced the cost to, uh, per barrel to, to ninety six to ninety six cents. Uh, what else? What else did I, did I want to uh, uh, say on this? Yeah, and, and uh, uh, Rockefeller at Standard was one of the first among the first to ship by tank cars, which was an economical means of transportation. And by eighteen sixty nine. A standard already owned, or at least Rockefeller's company already owned, 78 uh, tank cars. They built tanks for storing both crude and refined oil and no longer had to rely on barrels, you know, like, like the smaller companies. So, so Rockefeller was an absolute uh, stickler for efficiency. He looked for every possible way to cut costs, uh, you know, can't keep the price of production down. And we know what the result, we know what the result of, of, of that was, right? And again, to quote. Yeah, those. you had thousands of capitalist ahead, manifesto. Yeah. One, one of my favorite resources on this topic. So, you know, you had thousands of people going into the refining business. And there was just, like we said, way more capacity for refining than there was crude oil to refine. So there's just massive push uh, up on the cost of crude and down on the cost of kerosene. And something like 75% of refiners in the early 1870s were losing money. And they were losing on average something like 75 cents per barrel. The only way to continue to make money was to be incredibly efficient. And Rockefeller, long sighted as he was, had already devised means to, to stay in business, to be extremely efficient. You know, he was all about, you know, he said that we're, we must remember that we're refining oil, oil for the poor man and he must have it good and cheap. 
And the good was really important too, because kerosene was a, a noted cause of death at the time. Kerosene was pretty, uh, you know, hit or miss. And that's why that's part of the reason Rockefeller wanted to call his company standard oil is to say, you know, we're, we're just going to produce one really great product. It's going to be uh, consistent every time you get it because you know, the, the kerosene you'd get at the time, you, you, it could blow you up and you could die from it. So, um, they needed it good and cheap, and he was all about finding the cheapest way to create everything. There's uh, right. Let me let me one let me, really interesting. Let me give you another, oh yeah, go ahead. Give, let me give you another quote from from Catman. Uh, but but you, you're right. By the mid 1880s, Standard Oil controlled 90 percent of America's refining industry, and had pushed the price down from 58 cents to eight cents a gallon. Now, uh, there's the there's the result of Rockefeller's matchless efficiency that my company can make a profit at prices lower than any other company can can profit and of course the enormous benefit to the customers and the, the, that now you have this illuminant uh, you, you know at, at, at very inexpensive prices uh, now this is before Thomas Edison you know, what a, what an era this was right I mean so you can see why in <laughs> In, in, in Catman, I, I changed the name of it from the Gilded Age to, to the Inventive Period. I mean, this is before, shortly before Edison electrifies New York City, and then eventually, you know, well, Westinghouse and Tesla are able, using eight, eight alternating current rather than direct current, are able to you know light up via electricity, you know, the, pretty much the entire country. But before that, uh, you know, people go, going back just a few a mere decades, people were still using candles. And it was it was the Rockefeller with the with the kerosene, you know, de um, producing so much of it and bringing the price down that enabled people to light their homes with gas lamps, which was dangerous. You're, you're right. You know, people say, don't forget to turn off the gas before you go. You turn off the, the lamps before you go to sleep because, you know, the, 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 the gas lamps were, were dangerous. But uh, still, it made reading and studying a nighttime activity that that people you know, could you, you it's not convenient and not good for your eyes to do that by candlelight but by but by gas lamps you know people were able to read and engage in you know in study at night not just during the day they weren't reliant on sunlight for this so it opened up you know, whole new possibilities for people you know uh, at, at night so and, and of course eventually like i said with the gasoline you know, in the automobile uh, industry, bringing the price down to a to a point where uh, cost it's inexpensive for the customers, and yet because of our efficiency, we can still make money. You know, this this was critical, and of course, we'll, you know, we'll we'll see. This is the bottom line for how Rockefeller was able to absorb so many of the other uh, other oil companies, wasn't it? Yeah, and I think the math on it, I've read figures that <clears throat> it became something like thirty times cheaper to light your house at night with kerosene than it had been prior. And so that means that millions of people for the first time are able to read at night. They're given hours and hours extra to their lives, to millions of people. This is just one of the most incredibly beneficial things that could possibly happen. If you think about it. These people were given hours to their lives, hours that they would otherwise be sleeping because there's not much you can do just sitting around in the dark. Yeah, maybe the birth rates went down a little bit too when when people had other things to do. <laughs> and I'm just guessing. I'm just guessing here. <laughs> but but um, yeah, absolutely. Especially in light of Ayn Rand's later insight that the mind, you know, the mind is mankind's means of survival. You're, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the the hours then the the extended hours by which we could study, you know, get an education, the the, the, the develop our our minds. Who knows? It'd be interesting to go back through a biography of uh, Thomas Edison himself, who was an autodidact. He was a self, you know, he was he was, a, he was largely self-educated. Uh, how much he benefited from this? That you know, read it up because he. You know, I, I keep mentioning on the show he got kicked out of the fourth grade. You know, the headmaster told his mother the kid's brain was addled. You know, so uh, you know by the time you got kerosene lamps, I mean uh, Edison himself, who, who was later to be, ironically was later to replace them with electricity, uh, very likely benefited from those additional hours of study. One of the one of the great ironies, you know, in the, in the history of technology. But yeah, the the the, the increased hours uh, 
to study. Uh, it, it's incalculable how many minds you know were able to to, to advance their own education by by you know via reading uh, because of, because of Rockefeller's efforts. It's, it's, it's just fascinating, you know, the way. Uh, Positive improvement uh, in a free country leads to more positive improvements. It's, it's a fascinating topic that somebody somebody could write a book, of, you know, book about that. Yeah, capitalism has this positive snowballing effect, and it, it just raises all boats. It really does. So, yeah. um, you know, shall we talk about some acquisitions then? Uh, some of yeah. Rockefeller's yeah, and, early and, acquisitions. And Ida, yes, and and also bring up yeah. Ida Tarbell. You know, and her, her criticisms of uh, of of Rocker. So, so go ahead. The early acquisitions. Yeah. So uh, in 1871, December 1871, Rockefeller made his first acquisition. He saw that uh, that you know the market was just flooded. There were too many people competing in the refining market, and the best means to to uh, grow his company and also to to lower the cost for customers was just to continue to consolidate. So in December 1871, uh, their company buys out their biggest competitor in Cleveland. Uh, he even gave them, and he did this often, but in this case, he gave them $150,000 over the market value for the company as a gesture of goodwill. Uh, and they, you know, one of the things he did, and he did this often as well, was he showed them the books. This is his biggest competitor. He shows them his books and shows them what uh, Standard is able to profit, and they're just astounded by how much money Standard is, is able to make. And so he says, you know, sell to us and then buy Standard stock. You'll make more money than you are now. And, you know, it, you know in many cases, he offered people jobs, and that's how he acquired lots of talent, he brought a lot of talent into the company through these acquisitions. But anyway, December 17, uh, 1871, first acquisition, and then over the next several months, between then and, and March of the following year, he was able to buy out 21 of his 26 competitors in Cleveland. And with that, he took these 24 different refineries and built six state-of-the-art facilities that were able to produce uh, 10,000 barrels a day, up from 1,500 barrels a day, which is just an insane increase in productive uh, capacity. And you know he he foresaw this. One of his uh, chief chiefs in command later said that uh, they all everybody that worked at the business tried to see as far ahead as they could, but nobody could see as far ahead as Rockefeller. Indeed, he could see around corners. So, right, uh, you know he starts right. he starts picking up other refineries here in the early 1870s, and this is how he's able to build such a. a enormous and productive company. Yeah, you, you know, it's interesting. We, we look at the criticisms of, you know, of, of, of these productive giants. And I, I don't, I, Matthew Josephson popularized the term robber barons in his, in his, in his book of, of that title, 1930s, uh, was published. Uh, the, the, that term might have been around before that. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But, you know, the, the, the main criticisms of these productive giants um, always, always swirls around the little guy, you know, uh, uh, alleged mistreatment of the little guys. And um, Con in Carnegie's case, it, uh, the the criticism has, has always been that he was a harsh taskmaster towards to, to his workers, you know, and the, and the strikes, the Homestead strike, which you know, which we'll discuss when we when we discuss Andrew Carnegie as uh, you know on on the Hero Show with Rockefeller. So so for Carnegie, it was mostly mistreatment. The accusations is generally mistreatment of his workers. With Rockefeller, it's mistreatment of his competitors. And uh, and you and, and you're, you're you know you're making a real a really good point when he buys out his first competitor he shows them you know that the the you know the uh, because of their efficiency the the low price at which they that's they, that they they could charge their customers and still make a profit and the competitor knows he can't he can't compete and and Rockefeller is, 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 gives them you know above market value like you said it's great it's great advice he said take the money. Buy standard stock. I mean, you know, that's that's great advice. You'll make more. You'll make more money. You know, that's that's uh, that that's outstanding. Hopefully, the competitor did. You know, uh, exactly that because standard stock was became the, you know worth uh, a lot of money. But the the bottom line here is just just like you're saying is these other these smaller companies couldn't make a profit. Uh, you know, it, 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 there's 
enormous amount of competition. Price is coming down. They weren't. They simply weren't nearly as efficient as Rockefeller. They couldn't profit at the at the at the prices that Rockefeller could. Uh, and so the wise policy was for them to was for them to sell to Rockefeller. And when Rockefeller's critics, you know, are, are lambasting him for for you know um, under, underselling his competitors and thereby you know contributing to them going out of business and, and, and him be, being able to, to buy them out. They, they never talk about the customers, the consumers. You know, you're bringing the price down. Gazillions of people are benefiting from the lower prices. And Carnegie, Carnegie did the same thing in the steel industry, which fueled, like I said, not just uh, Henry Ford's ability to make automobiles inexpensively and sell them to millions of customers, but the skyscraper, again, the distinctively American contribution to, in the field of architecture, the skyscraper would not have been financially possible except for Carnegie bringing the price of steel down enormously. He was a, a great stickler for, for uh, efficiency and bringing, you know, bring, redu cutting costs and bringing the price down. And, you know, between the two of them, Carnegie and Rockefeller, I mean, I mean, they supplied the building material, steel for industrial civilization, and the fuel, you know, kerosene, gasoline, and made and, and just made possible to an enormous uh, degree uh, the rising standard of living in, 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 in the United States. So I always got to keep sight of that. Efficiency leads to lower costs, which enormously benefits the customers or the, you know, the consumers who save money on this benefit from the advance, whether it's steel or, or oil products. And then what did they do with the, with the money they saved? You know, they, with that, the money they saved on, 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 on purchasing these uh, you know, essentials, they could then put in the bank and save, or they could invest, or they could buy something else. So, you know, the, the focus always here, I think, has to be on uh, Rockefeller, uh, enormously productive, uh, advancing uh, human life. And, uh, we, we, and, and again, with the, with the competitors, they simply couldn't, they weren't efficient enough to, to, to profit at the uh, prices that Rockefeller could, could profit at. That's, that's the bottom line as to why he was able to buy out all of his competitors, or so many of his competitors. Yeah, a lot of people charge Rockefeller with predatory pricing, which is really, it's a, a huge mis misnomer. So predatory pricing for one is a misnomer because predation actually means something like using force against someone. But if all you do is charge less and you offer more value for less money to your customer, that's a voluntary tra transaction between you and your customer. Now, he did do this with the intent of demonstrating to his competitors how much more efficient he was. But another piece of this misnomer is a lot of people think, well, predatory pricing is selling your product at cost or at a loss in order to drive out your competitor and your competitor is going to take a bigger hit than you are and so they're going to they're going to fail sooner than you will but rockefeller didn't have to sell at cost or at a loss and, and generally didn't he just was able to sell it so much cheaper and still make a profit because he was, his company was so much more efficient and the other piece of this claim is that well you drive out your competitors and then it's just you and then you can raise the price arbitrarily and knock other people's uh, you, you know, other people are, are going to have no choice but to deal with this one person who can do whatever they want with a price, which is demonstrated to be absolutely false in the case of Rockefeller. By the time he had a 90% market share in kerosene, he was still dropping the price. It went from nine to eight to seven cents a gallon, still dropping the price. And, you know, he, he was never short sighted about this stuff. He understood that he could get competition from other markets. And as you pointed out, Edison was to soon bring that competition with the electric light bulb. So, you know, uh, Rockefeller right. was ready for that, but he never used his incredible market share as a, as a, you know, a bludgeon to, to get others to pay astronomical prices that, that never occurred. It's anti, it's anti-capitalist propaganda. You know, that's, that's, it's, it's leftist propaganda because a, a Rockefeller, you know, a brilliant businessman knows I have 90% of the market share at, at eight cents, you know, per, per gallon. And, and now I, wow, I'm going to raise it to 10 or 12 or 15 or 20. You know, it, it simply invites 
other entrepreneurs, you know, one, it invites other entrepreneurs to come into, into the field to, to, to compete against them. And if he keeps doing that up and down to put this guy out of business, he loses confidence of the customer. So we'll never trust him again, you know, and we'll, and, and we'll patronize uh, entrepreneurs who come into business against him. And two, you know, what, like you said, John, and a lot of people don't realize, there's no, there's, there may be no uh, product on earth that is so unique that it can't be that you can't compete against it with something else, you know. You 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 know the uh, the the automobile is you know is 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 extraordinary. But uh, if if the if the price of automobiles be, becomes uh, too high that people can't afford them, uh, are there no alternative means of transportation? You know, buses and railroads and even you know for short distances, bicycles. You know, and you know, and, and things like that. There's nothing that can't be replaced, and it's and it's, and good example that uh, you know kerosene lamps, as valuable as they were, and you know, go, going beyond candles, uh, you know, and 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 everything, Ele- electricity uh, th- through Edison and, and you know, and, and later Westinghouse and Tesla, you know, uh, is is even better. Reminds me, John, we were just discussing Sherlock Holmes, you know, uh, on the Hero Show f- a few weeks ago. And I was just rereading some Sherlock Holmes stories, and you know, and just like the other day, and Watson said, you know, so so I lit my candle and went into the bedroom. And I said, candle? I said, it's eighteen eighties in London. You know, he's 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 using candlelight. Uh, you you know, and I guess you know the the I did, I, I was surprised. I figured they were using you know kerosene lamps like Rockefeller had you know had popularized in the, and made possible in the United States. And I guess that innovation had it across the pond uh, just yet. But yeah, but you know, you know, one, yeah, it's a huge advance over, over candlelight. And two, yeah, and Rockefeller understood. There's always, there's always uh, lurking competition. And if I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna continue to stay in business, I gotta keep the price low. And, and, and thereby, what it also does is, you know, a really good businessman like Rockefeller understands you want, it's in your rational self-interest to generate goodwill amongst the customers, that they know they could trust the company. Standard Oil, like you said, and they could trust the company. We're not going to raise the prices again. So it doesn't give any traction for competitors to come in because the customers are very happy with my company. And, I, and I, one thing I also want to say, you know, morally here, John, I think we should, we should say, you know, Rockefeller was very aware that he's benefiting enormous, enormous numbers of, of, of human beings and, you know, promoting human life. The poor man must get it good and, you know, the oil good and cheap and everything. But, you know, as devoutly as religious as he was, we don't want to, you know, claim that he's an altruist or that his, uh, you know, his great benefit is in, you know, helping the, the, the lives of others, although I'm sure that was a source of joy to him. But, you know, like Howard Rock says in The Fountainhead, in order to excel at something, you have to love the doing. You know, and presumably Rockefeller loved this, the, the productive work, you, you know, just the work of, uh, he's a creative genius, in, uh, as is Carnegie, you know, in the field of material production. They're, they're not artists, but in a way, in a way they are. This, they're creative geniuses, just like Michelangelo is a creative genius, just like Leonardo is, just like Shakespeare. They're creative geniuses in the field of material production. They're creating wealth. And this has to be enormously satisfying to... to to Rockefeller. In fact, he, a, a great quote from Rockefeller that, that continually bedevils his critics because they're all admirers of his philanthropy, and, and yet they, you know, they excoriate him for, you know, his his work at Standard. And yet, I don't remember the exact wording, but Rockefeller said at one point that I, you know, I did vastly more good at Standard Oil than I ever did in all in all of my philanthropy. And to the left, this <laughs> go, what? <laughs> but this is what Rockefeller is talking about. The, the, the virtue of productivity that, that Ayn Rand, you know, uh, really dramatizes in, in, in Atlas Shrugged. The enormously egoistic uh, aspect of it. One in, you know, where you're worth 400 <laughs> worth four hundred billion dollars, you know, at the early 20th century. But more fundamentally than, than that is the love the doing, like Howard Rock says, the tremendous pride and satisfaction a creative person has in creating wealth, whether material or intellectual. So for all of his Baptist religion, Rockefeller was was very egoistic and you know and justifiably so, properly so. Yeah, he, he loved and knew every aspect of his business. There's this great story 
and uh, Rockefeller is uh, he's he's just bought a refinery, I believe, in New York. And at the refinery, they also package kerosene to be shipped across the pond over to Europe. And they're using 40 dots of, uh, what is it? Um, uh, not welding, but um, I, I forget the name, but they're using uh, 40 dots of, of this stuff to close a canister of kerosene. And he asks, have you ever tried using 38 instead? Um, <laughs> the guy says, no, we haven't done that. But he said, yeah, give it a shot. See, see how that works. Let me know. Well, they did. They tried 38. There's, there's some leaks and stuff. It, it wasn't quite right. They went to 39 and it was found that there was no problem with 39. They went with that. And so that became the standard. And, and years later, Rockefeller said, well, in the, in the first year that saved us something like $1,500. And then in the second year that that doubled and it quadrupled and then over a course of several years that saved them uh several hundred thousand dollars just by by reducing that one little thing and he did that with every aspect of his business and loved doing that he also loved right. being a leader and he was an excellent excellent leader one of the best you know some said that that no one had ever equaled him as a leader of uh, brilliant minds. He was something like an admired general of this army of, of other really, really brilliant uh, innovators, both scientific and, and business innovators. And uh, one of these things he says is chiefly to my confidence in men and my ability to inspire their confidence in me that I owe my success in life. Words of a leader. Absol absolutely. Uh, you know, and Rockefeller is a good example, as is, you know, to bring up Carnegie again, uh, the, the, the two of them, uh, of, of mind power in business. One of his, uh, one, 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 one business, I think it was William Vanderbilt, you know, son of Cornelius Vanderbilt, the great railroad builder. And William Vanderbilt was the guy responsible for building uh, Grand Central Station in, in, in New York City. I think it was William Vanderbilt who said of Rockefeller, you know, I've known a lot of intelligent men in, in, in business, but Rockefeller and his team at Standard, I've never known anybody, I, I'm paraphrasing it, never known anybody as smart as, as, as these guys are. And this, is, this accounts for you know, uh, a great deal of their success. And you're absolutely right. Rockefeller was expert. His, this, and this, this, his um, a couple of points, you know, uh, contra Marx, you know, who's, who's a philosophic materialist, Karl Marx, a material. We did him on the on the village show, which was great. You know, he was a <laughs> philosophic materialist. Everything if it means everything is matter. If everything is matter, then human beings are bodies, and it stands to reason. Then the way we produce wealth of any kind is by manual labor, by the work of the of the hands and of the body. Now, Ayn Rand, you know, dynamites this view in, in Atlas Shrugged, showing that you know it's the human intelligence that's the fundamental cause of wealth creation, whether it's material wealth or uh, uh, sp intellectual, spiritual wealth. But Rockefeller is a perfect example of it, as, as was Carnegie in the steel industry. Both those guys, they knew every aspect of the business down to every last detail. They were geniuses. Uh, Rockefeller was a genius in the oil industry, and Carnegie was a genius in the steel industry. They were like, nobody's omniscient. But these two guys in their field came as close to, to being omniscient about every aspect of the, you know, every aspect of, of the uh, oil industry. Rockefeller kn knew everything, well, as close to everything as, in, as any one, one person could do. And this is, you know, you know chiefly responsible for his, 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 his vision and his, just his, uh, you know, his dynamic abilities as, a, as an industrialist. And this, you know, the genius of these, of, of these guys it's it's simply it, it's it, it makes me want to weep you know it's so unjust the way they're criticized and then and they're never very rarely praised for their genius their creativity you know and and their you know their production of material wealth making human life human life possible making human life much better and um you know one of the other one of the other criticisms john uh is on about rebates and so but before the end of the show we need to discuss you know, the rebate issue, but you, you, you might want to add something about Rockefeller's genius and his, his, his knowledge of the field, or should we move on? Yeah, he said, we, we had vision, we saw the vast possibilities of the oil industry, stood at the center of it, and brought our knowledge and imagination and business experience to bear in a dozen, in 20, and 30 directions. I love this quote from Rockefeller. He's talking about 
all the various things that they made with this one product, the ways that they integrated the business both vertically and horizontally. Uh, we talked about you know tank cars, but he also went into the transportation industry. He started the National Transit Company uh, when he when he saw that uh, oil pipelines were the the new standard for uh, transporting oil. So just incredible, incredible creative vision. And then people, like you said, they they attribute his success. This is so silly, but they attribute his success to things like, well, the railroads gave him really cheap pricing because you know he he used a lot of of their capacity. It's really funny. Like you go to the grocery store and you you see those deals, you know, buy buy five for the price of four or something, and and people understand that that just makes logical sense well yeah you're buying more so you get it you get a better deal but then they they come to examine rockefeller's legacy with the uh with the, the railroads and they just think that somehow the railroads conspired with rockefeller to to knock out his competitors no he was saving them vast amounts of money by having guaranteed product to ship on a regular basis that meant they could do the math they could they could use x amount of cars to uh to to get the work done um, they could make those big investments and build their own infrastructure around this guaranteed business, which was just a huge boon to the railroads. So yes, he, he did get rebates, but <laughs> that was an earned benefit. And it actually was a win-win-win, really, because it benefited both Rockefeller, benefited the railroad companies, and it benefited the other people who then benefited from this enhanced uh, capacity of the railroads. So everybody benefited the customer won out of that. Out of that. Yeah. Right. It, benefit the customer yeah 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 absolutely it's it's just it's just profoundly mistaken first of all it's good business sense you know for the railroads if you have a if you have a shipper you know if the carrier the railroads has a shipper like rockefeller who's shipping enormous quantities uh, it, it absolutely you know the, the, and the railroads are in competition for this you know the, the railroads the railroads want you know the shippers to to ship with with them, and so it makes sense for the the railroads competing. Who who's the guy that they that they most want to ship with them? Well, the guy who's shipping in the va in the vastest quantities, you know, for whom they'll make the the most money. So it absolutely makes sense to, for them to lower their prices for the guy who's you know the 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 heaviest the heaviest shipper. It's just it's just good business sense. It's completely honest. You sign a contract, both parties. You know, uh, sign the contract, and you know, and 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 they live up to it. And like you said, it's a it's a win win win. Every everybody benefits from it. And the competitors, well, again, you know, they the the best advice to give them is either emulate Rockefeller's efficiency so that you too can uh, profit at at very at very low prices, and then cut into build your market share, or Sell to Rockefeller and buy Standard Oil stock, like Rockefeller said, <laughs> and you'll make, you know, and you'll 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 make money. But this is completely honest, above board business practice. It makes economic sense, uh, and it's and and it's honest. You, you sign a contract, and you, you know, both parties live up to the contract. There's no basis for for this moral outrage, you know, from the leftist, you know, anti-capitalist historians, except for their built-in Marxist the. the where it comes from is this built-in Marxist prejudice against, uh, you know, against egoism. That it, that if you're so successful yourself, you must necessarily be exploiting somebody. You know, you know you're exploiting somebody. If it's not your customers, which it certainly is not with Rockefeller, there's got to be your competitors. Uh, and so there's 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 zero basis for, for for their moral outrage. And you know, the idea that Rockefeller. Uh, and Standard Oil became this huge success because of rebates. It's ridiculous. You have cause and effect reversed. They wouldn't have been able to get the rebates except they were already producing an enormous amount of oil. You know, they all. You know, that's why the company, the railroad companies, wanted their business. So it, it's, it was clearly the rebates is not the first cause of Rockefeller's business success. It's an effect. The rebates are an effect of Rockefeller's already uh, substantial business success. Yeah, kind of mocking this idea of, of the leftist who, who thinks that, you know, he must have been exploiting people. He said at one point, who were we that we should succeed where so many others failed? Of course, there was something wrong, some dark, evil mystery, or we never should have succeeded. 
there was, you know, there's no plausible explanation. It wasn't their creativity. It wasn't the fact that they were gung ho about efficiency and just really hard workers. You know, it had to be that they had done something evil to to pull one over on all these other people that they should succeed. Right. Right. Yeah. So Rockefeller's mockery there is 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 well taken. We should mention Ida Top Bell, right? Who who was an early critic of. Uh, of Rockefeller, so again, just happened to have a handy a copy of Cat Man's, you know, Capitalist Manifesto by accident. And uh, so I'll read a paragraph here regarding Rockefeller. Perhaps his most effective critic, maybe giving her a little too much credit credit here, was Ida Tarbell, whose history of the Standard Oil Company was well documented and filled with useful information. She assailed Rockefeller for, among other things, both the rebates he received from the railroads and for allegedly intimidating smaller refineries into selling out the, the standard oil. The Rockefeller she painted was a ruthless competitor, unconcerned with the ruin he brought on, on others. One of whom was her father, you know, who uh, owned a, a, small, um, a small, small oil company that Rock, I don't know if Rockefeller bought it out or, or if the company went out of business simply because it couldn't compete with, with Rockefeller. Uh, so, you know, the, the original animus of Ida Tarbell towards uh, Rockefeller was based on, you know, family considerations. But does it, which that, that in and of itself doesn't make her wrong. If, if I said she's wrong because of that, that would be the fallacy of ad, ad hominem. I think she's mistaken for all the reasons that, we, that, that we've been giving. But anyway, just listen to the language. For example, speaking of, of the dreams of the independent Pennsylvania oil producers, she wrote, quote, but suddenly, at the very heyday of, of this confidence, a big hand reached out from nobody knew where to steal their conquest and throttle their future. The suddenness and blackness of the assault, unquote, the suddenness and blackness of the assault, she blamed, of course, of course on the supposedly iniquitous uh, Rockefeller. So, you know, Ida Tarbell has some, you know, I read, I read her book when I was reading Catman. She, you know, she, does, she did her research. She has, some, she has some facts. But her moral condemnation is, 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 is completely, you know, mistaken for all the reasons, you know, that, that we've been giving. Uh, the, the bottom line economic reality is the other companies simply were not as efficient as Rockefeller. This bears repetition and couldn't compete against them. This is why. They went out of business, and that's the way it should be. You know, on a, that's the way it is on a free market, and it's, and it's the way it should be. The most productive companies win the the vote in the marketplace. Where, you know, every day where customers vote vote with their dollars. And Rockefeller's company was the most productive, so sold at the at the most inexpensive inexpensive prices. That's why the customers love Rock of, you know, love Standard, and, and why he controls something like ninety percent of, you know, of. Oh, oh, by the way, 90% of, of American productivity. But Rockefeller, think about this. We, we talk about uh, his efficiency. Rockefeller was able to compete with the Russians successfully in Europe. This, you know, despite the Russians having the, geogra you know, the advantage of geographic proximity and Rockefeller having to ship across the pond, he was still, you know, the shipping costs are, you know, uh, obviously, you know, are expensive and wouldn't... Uh, Cause you to raise your, your raise your prices to, to you know to make up for that increased cost. But Rockefeller was so efficient, he was still <laughs> refining oil at such a such a low price. He was able to he was able to compete effectively, you know, despite the the, the vast geographic disadvantage. Now that's just an extraordinary testament to, to the to the productivity and the efficiency of Standard Oil. Absolutely, I think there's a one other piece of the criticism that that. Uh, Ida Tarbell and, and others make is that he participated in, in a couple of cartels. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting. Yeah, the, the South Improvement Company and there's also the, the Pittsburgh plan. It's really interesting that, that this is a criticism because these things really never got off the ground. And both of them uh, did more to harm Rockefeller than they did to help him. So for, you know, for the South Improvement Plan, the plan was that the Railroad companies were going to double the rates of everyone that was not part of the cartel. The refineries within the cartel would then decrease production in order to artificially raise their prices. And the oil producers, those who weren't in the cartel, the first link in this, in this whole supply chain, weren't part of the cartel. They, they 
they boldly refused to pay these arbitrarily doubled rates. And so they bought, they, they boycotted both the railroads and the member, uh, the member refineries that were part of the cartel. So they virtually stopped the refining business, including Standard Oil's business. Uh, Rockefeller had to lay off several thousand employees in Cleveland alone. And so this was, you know, far from helping Rockefeller, this was a really bad business decision. And he succeeded in spite of this, not because of it. And the same thing goes with the, you know, the Pittsburgh plan that also failed in short order. Um, the, you know, yeah, it's a price. I'm sorry, John, go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, the, these things are really bad mechanisms for attempting to increase prices without increasing value. And Rockefeller, you know, it, it is surprising because he, he, throughout his career, understood the connection between the, the price of something and the value. I think in part, he was motivated to uh, see these through as a, as a means of demonstrating to some of his lesser, lesser competitors that they really ought to align with Standard Oil, ought to, ought to be acquired by Standard Oil. But, you know, in, in the end, these were just bad business decisions. And they were part of what we use today. They were you know, they're case studies in the fact that cartels simply don't work. They're just economically poor decisions. Yeah, it's really surprising, even shocking, that Rockefeller, you know, you know we're fallible beings, right? The, the greatest, I mean, what it shows us is that the greatest genius in a given field, we, 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 we make errors. And it's shocking, uh, given what a business genius Rockefeller was, that, that he, he made such a poor uh, business decision. He, 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 you, you would think Rockefeller would know this is, you know, uh, you know uh, 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 his long range vision, you know, he wasn't a fly by night guy. His, his, his plan was to be successful for decades, you know, for long into the future. And to do that, you, you want to establish goodwill with your customers. You know, having, uh, instilling confidence in your customers is really important. He had, you, you would think Rockefeller was seen, this is going to create a lot of animus, you know, a lot of bad will, uh, you know, uh, uh, amongst, my, amongst my client base, amongst my customers. And he, he did see it eventually, but first he had to take the first he had to take the take the blow. So I'm very surprised, you know, that that Rockefeller, you know, would engage in this kind of business practice. That in the long run, you know, you you have to think is going to harm is going to harm his business by undercutting, you know, customer confidence in the in him and in and, and in the company. So it's, so it's very surprising. But you're right; it's it's it, it was negative. Uh, Rockefeller certainly. If anybody believes that Rockefeller succeeded because of the South Improvement Company, you know, they're just they're just flat wrong. This harmed his his business. It did it. It, it didn't help it. You, you you put it nicely. He succeeded despite this stupid business decision, not not because of it. And we've never been shy about criticizing heroes for you know for poor decisions or immoral actions on on you know on the show. This is this is a very poor decision on, on Rockefeller's part. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's glaring when you look at the full context because there's like one after another wise business decision, wise business decision, wise business decision that benefits him, benefits the railroads, benefits the customers. You know, this one was very poor uh, business judgment and hurt, hurt him and, and, and the company. Yeah, some attribute the ideas to get into these cartels to some of his, his you know, high level business associates, uh, was it Wayne Flagler? I might be, I might be mixing names here, but Flagler, uh, last name Flagler, uh, is sometimes, uh, you know, given the blame for the, for this idea, but regardless, at the end of the day, Rockefeller's at the helm and he could have opposed it and did not. So yeah, it, it's a, it's a mark against him on an, an otherwise amazing record of creative and industrial production. Definitely one of America's greatest uh, entrepreneurs in history and deserving of incredible praise. I mean, just think of, of the hours that he gave to the lives of millions of people. And that alone had this just enormous productive impact on America. And then, as you pointed out, later on European countries as well. Rockefeller made another wise decision in, with the woman he married, uh, Laura Spellman. Who uh, Laura Spellman Rockefeller, who was evidently a, a extremely intelligent and highly, you know, uh, incisive woman, who he, he relied upon as his main confidant and, and advisor. 
uh, in a way, it, it reminds me in a way, you know, of the relationship John Adams had with, with Abigail Adams, who, when he was president, he, he, she was really his cabinet. She couldn't officially serve on the cabinet, but she was his, his chief advisor. So, you know, for, for brilliant women like Abigail Adams and, and Laura, Laura Spellman Rockefeller back in those days, you know, that was, that was their way, to, you know, to both romantic love and not, you know, not just romantic love, but to actually have a career. Today, you know, uh, women of that ability could have their own career uh, uh, as well as being married to, you know, the, the man, you know, that, that she loves. But, but, but his wife evidently, and they had, I think they had like five children. They had a number, they had a number of children. So his, his wife uh, was an extraordinary woman. As, again, very, very wise decision on, on Rockefeller's part in a career filled with them was just a few, you know, a few major exceptions. Um, <laughs> philanthropy, philanthropy, we There's did, as, as a last nice point, we we should discuss there, there's philanthropy. There's one more parallel I think is really um, reflective on Rockefeller's character. It's that Spellman's father was a, uh, a high-level abolitionist and actually uh, was part of the Underground Railroad helping slaves over the Mason-Dixon get to freedom. And Spellman w was as well, his daughter. Uh, and Rockefeller also became an abolitionist and uh, actually paid for some slaves to be freed. So um, Spellman was a, a fantastic choice and, and was like Abigail Adams in that respect too. Right. And since I keep beating the drum for Andrew Carnegie, he was also a devout ab abolitionist. And Rockefeller and Carnegie, they, 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 I don't even know if the two of them liked each other, but you know they were contemporaries for like, 80 years or, or close to it and, and revolutionizing heavy industry in America, they set the template for philanthropy. And Rockefeller, I remember reading once, John, that Rockefeller gave away more money in philanthropy than anybody else at that time in history had ever owned. Uh, just hundreds of millions and hundreds of millions of, uh, of dollars. Now, from my, you know, my judgment, some of this money was squandered because he, he was a devout Baptist. He gave it to, you know, for various church you know, you know, very various denominations. Uh, he, uh, you know, and, and various you know, religious activities. But a lot of the money he gave away was enormously productive. You know, to, f to further education. Uh, you know, uh, to further medical research. A, a, a lot of this money Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller gave away in philanthropy went went to very good uses, didn't it? Yeah, we could wish that he took a page from Benjamin Franklin, who you know, devoted a huge sum of money to the cities of both Boston and Philadelphia and said that this was earmarked as a fund for uh, new tradesmen. And, it, you know, it's, it's there to, for them to take very low interest loans from so that they can do things like go through school or get training. It would have been great if Rockefeller had done something like that. That would still be, you know, that fund would still be going. It would only be gaining in value because it'd be invested in things like mutual funds and, and whatnot. But, but he didn't. But nonetheless, yeah, we, we still benefit from Rockefeller's incredible uh, productivity, which allowed him to to be so charitable with his money. Yeah, the productivity above all, as he as he himself said. Now, I, now some of Rockefeller's associates and, and perhaps Rockefeller himself, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, donated money. That part of their philanthropy was uh, for Booker T. Washington, you know, the, the great educator at Tuskegee Institute. You know, back then, this was the Jim Crow South, uh, the, the the racists who controlled the state legislatures. They didn't care about educating black children. They didn't put they didn't put any money into you know schools for for black children. So Booker T. Washington uh, raised money from from northern uh, uh, businessmen. Julius Rosenwald, that Sears Roebuck was a notable uh, investor in this. Uh, some of Rockefeller's associates at Standard invested in this. I'm not sure if Rockefeller him, himself did, but I know he did put. A good deal of money into education, and Booker T. Washington was able to, you know, build thousands, literally several thousand schools across the Jim Crow South for uh, for black children. And generations later, you know, led to the rise led to the rise of an educated uh, black class in in in, in the South, including uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, to spearhead you know, the, the civil rights movement, or as I like to think of it, the, the individual rights movement for, for black Americans. But yeah, some of Rockefeller's money went into med, to fund medical research and to, to fund education. Uh, and so Rockefeller continuing an illustrious, productive career 
with philanthropy that uh, some of which was was also productive. And we don't want to fall into the trap of these leftist anti-capitalist historians of celebrating Rockefeller for his philanthropy. The philanthropy in some cases was productive, but above all, Rockefeller is a giant because of what he did at Standard Oil. The productivity and and presumably, you know, not just the his own wealth, you know, people be, be worth purchasing power in today's terms of four hundred billion dollars is unbelievable. But you know, even more important than that, egoistically, it's nice to I I would think it'd be nice to earn four hundred billion dollars, especially when you've earned it. But even more important than that, Howard Rock is right. You love the doing, you love the creative work, you love the productivity. This is the real egoistic part uh, in Rockefeller's life. And I I to give him two thumbs up for you know uh, a, you know, a few <laughs> critical errors in his life. But above all, an enormously heroic life. And I got to salute, you know, John D. Rockefeller's heroism and his enormous productivity. Last words on the on this topic, John? Well, one more quote from Rockefeller. He said, I would have every man a capitalist, every man, woman and child. I would have everyone save his earnings, not squander it. Own the industries, own the railroads. Own the telegraph lines. We could add today. Own the tech industries. You know, own own the Silicon Valley companies that are that are making waves with uh, things like augmented reality. But you know, I, amen to that. Own every. I would have every man a capitalist. <laughs> I agree. Own, own SpaceX. You know, and uh, I don't. And I'm not even sure. Is SpaceX a publicly traded company that you we, where we where we can buy shares and 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 be owners, uh, be, be part owners? I'm not. I don't really know. Sure. I, I, know don't, I don't know either. But if it is, yeah, yeah. If I'll put it hypothetically, if it is, uh, buy stock in SpaceX because uh, Elon Musk mixed case, but. He's going to Mars, you know. I, I have confidence that his company is going to be able to, you know, get to Mars. So John D. Rockefeller's uh, uh, quote is 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 well taken on this, and we salute Rockefeller's heroism. Grateful, thank you, you know, for, for you know for, for your achievements and the way they benefited benefited my life. I say I say gratefully, you know, to say thank you gratefully to John D. Rockefeller. Say well done. As Ayn Rand puts it in Atlas Shrugged, I think it was, it was a Ken Daniger who was talking to Dagny. Well done, Dagny. Well done. Uh, well, well done, John D. Well done, and, and, uh, and, and thank you. So, John and everybody out there in Hero Land, I wish you would have a more heroic day and to lead a more heroic life. So thank you, everybody. You too, Andy.